From Los Angeles, the home of film and television, this is Film Music Live, a webcast featuring outstanding composers, orchestrators, filmmakers, and more from the world of music for film, television, and video games, talking about their work and answering your questions. Film Music Live is sponsored by the Film Music Network and Film Music Institute. And now the host of Film Music Live, Daniel Schweiger. Hey everyone, I'm Daniel Schweiger and welcome to Film Music Live, the show where you get to ask the questions to today's top composers. I'm happy to have you here. From classical to computer to new wave, Germany has given birth to any number of musical styles. Now, no more impactfully alternative than the albums and scores conjured by Volker Bertelmann, or by his alter ego known as Hauschka. Creating the hip-hop band God's Favorite Dog, showing a soulful sound on the prepared piano with the album Substantial, and then introducing an intoxicating host of other organic and electronic instruments was Ceylon des Amateur. Bertelmann's work for German television and film made a nightmarishly unique American debut for the horror film The Boy. Bertelmann's work alongside composer Dustin O'Halloran brought Oscar-nominated acclaim with Lion's Search for Identity. Playing survival against the elements in the drift, terrorists inside the Hotel Mumbai, and space itself with stowaway, Bertelmann's intoxicating, often meditative way of thematically playing the light and darkness of the human experience led to an Academy Award for his terrifying yet mournful approach to the World War I trenches of All Quiet on the Western Front. Now Bertelmann powerfully ventures between England and Nazi-occupied Czechoslovakia for one life, as an English stockbroker engineers an exodus of refugee children before Hitler's net closes in. Bringing a classically oriented sense of suspenseful urgency and a legic melody to this astonishing true story, Bertelmann builds to one of his most moving pieces for a television surprise unlike any other. It's one life that again demonstrates the versatility and emotion that flows between both sides of his musical identity. And now here's a musician who's often given his soulfulness to the unthinkable amidst his transfixing work as an alternative artist. Welcome to Film Music Live, Volker Bertelmann, a.k.a. Hauschka. Hey, Daniel. Well, it's great to have you here. And uh, again, congratulations on such a moving and impactful film as One Life. Was, was being a composer something that you always saw as you developed as a musician? Um, no, I, I mean, you know, it, it was always a, um, a part of my, well, even when I was a kid, I was in a band where, where my, um, one of the band ma mates, his parents were, um, film directors and, um, they sometimes asked us if we can give them some songs for uh for their you know tv series um and so even in the age of 18 i was already giving some music to some films but i never paid attention too much to it because at that time i started to study medicine and i i felt i might will or I, I will be maybe a doctor at some point so music was at that point a very important part of of mine but never I never had a clear idea of what my profession in music will be. Is there anything in common between medicine and film composing? Uh, totally, totally. I think the analytic uh, way of thinking is, I think, in both ways, in both jobs, very similar. I mean, for my taste, because uh, in a way, when you, um, you know, when you are researching for you know, a, a medicine solution, or when you when you try to research, uh, um, you know, some about some illness of someone, you have to go uh, deep into an analytical um, thinking because you have to say this is not working, this doesn't work, this is not clear, and then you you try to figure out what kind of um, a treatment you are you're planning and with music it's you also need an analytical thought uh, you have to f put the ingredients together and find a way of how you can get all the information uh, that is in a film somehow transferred into music without 
pushing it too hard or without um, you know underlining already what is there um you you need to find a way of exactly doing the the opposite i would say to find an own language how did you develop your alternative superhero identity is hauska well when i was uh, when i was researching for my own sound um, in a way um you know I, I always felt like am i can i be a musician with an own identity because in the beginning when i learned piano i wasn't my education was okay but it was not like i wasn't a virtuous pianist i also never studied music so in a way there was always the question can i be a, a musician um, and um, that was in a way coming from the question of what part of the music do i want to work in do i want to be a band leader or a, like a songwriter or do i want to just be in the background do i want to be a singer so in a way i tried everything um you know i worked for advertising spots i did uh, logos i did all sorts of different um things in music and just to find out what my who i am in music and hauschka was the first time where i felt this is actually me doing in a way modern music with a piano now i think i became aware of your film score through still one of the truly insane horror scores i've ever heard which is for a really great bad seed thriller called the boy mm -hmm. yeah that was actually the very first um first film that i scored uh, first american movie that i scored uh, and that was giving me quite a push because um you know, I played at that time already concerts in the U.S. and I always loved to be there. Um, I, you know, I, I was welcomed so, so much there and um, people were supporting me and saying, hey, you, please move on. Please carry on with what you're doing. So in a way, I felt this uh, wind in my sails and... Uh, so I, I had the feeling that I want to um, maybe do the same with a, with film music. And so the boy was the first, the first kickoff. And coming from a, such a completely abstract score, you know, another really important uh, score for you early on was uh, getting an Oscar nomination for Lion, which is a very absolutely beautiful film about uh, an Indian man trying to search for his identity where you teamed with uh, Dustin Holler and another really great artist. What was that whole experience like? And again, getting a far more soulful sound for that. Well, that was uh, something that I um, experienced. Oh, that was actually the first time that uh, a director asked me directly, uh, do you want to score for my film? And um, I had a um, um, you know, I, I played a concert in um, uh, in Melbourne, and uh, Garth Davis, the director, came to the concert. And on my way to the concert hall, um, I got a phone call from my publish publisher, and uh, she said, um, "Hey, there's a director coming to your concert. Um, he wants to talk to you uh, afterwards." And I said, "Yeah, but I have to sell records, so." If he can stand in the line um, and come to the record table, so maybe I can, he can wave at me, and then we can have a chat. So, at some point, he was standing in a line, um, uh, you know, and just said, "Hey, I'm uh, Garth, uh, and uh, I would love to talk to you afterwards when you're finished." Um, but then it took another half an hour to sell everything, and uh, you know, because I'm selling my merch mostly myself, because what I love about it is that you are in touch with the audience. Um, and so he showed me a little thing on his uh, iPhone and uh, like a little snippet. And I said, oh, uh, that's not a student film. That's a different one. And uh, because the landscape was India in the, the drain ride in India. Um, and then he asked me if I would be interested in scoring the film with someone together. And I said, oh, I'm not sure with someone together that doesn't work mostly, um, you know, uh, but who is it? And then he said, it's Dustin O'Halloran. And Dustin was at that time already uh, one of my best friends. And we, um, he was at my marriage. We were very close and he was the person I could imagine 
work with. So I said to him, if if it's Dustin, I'm totally fine. And I learned on that whole journey a lot about um, cue sheets, scoring in general. I learned about the U the LA uh, workflow and um, how you set up a, a computer, a ride, and all that. I had no idea what this is all about. And all of this, of course, sets you on the course to winning an Oscar for All Quiet on the Western Front. Uh, what was that whole experience like to suddenly be in that kind of spotlight? Well, it was nice to see actually the Oscars uh, a, a week ago um, and um, imagining and I was re reflecting on that. I was actually a week before the Oscars. I was in L.A. in the same hotel where I stayed uh, during the Oscars. And so um, reflecting on that, uh, I, I had the feeling that the nicest part of it is, of course, when you win, that's great. But being nominated is already uh, such an honor and you know such a journey because you are invited to all these great meetings and dinners and uh, you meet colleagues um, you have a, you have a conversation with them and of course over the time uh, until the the celebration is happening there is this tension building up and you don't know um, is there do you have a chance at all is it just you know, so in a way, the only thing you can survive that is by saying, oh, I'm nominated. I'm very happy just to be around these great colleagues. Um, if your name is then called, um, then you are, uh, you know, you are in a tunnel in a way. You, you have to practice your speech beforehand. That's actually what I did because I had the feeling when I'm, my name will be called, I, I need a little bit of a, a safety feeling and um and then you know you it's a it's a trip you are then for a whole couple of days completely you know on a ride you know one thing that really strikes me again you did a really powerful score for an incredible movie called hotel mumbai about the terrorist attack on a hotel and then mm -hmm. all quiet on the western front which is about trench warfare and in a way, it all kind of leads into one life. Uh, you know, when you look at it again, I, I really think of you as, a, with the exception of boys, being a very soulful composer. And a lot of your work has dealt with the effects of violence and people dealing with violence. How, how do you think it kind of goes to this point? Well, I mean... You know the the I don't know why that was in the last um, couple of movies. Um, there was mostly either a very emotional, very subtle score um, that I got asked for, or there was a kind of violent thriller um, or like a dark uh, topic. But in every film um, in the last couple of years, mostly had a kind of quite soulful message um, in it. And that was very interesting for me um, that people were, that I had the feeling I, I'm so happy to be part of films where people, after they left uh, the cinema, where they start talking with each other about maybe their sense of life or how they, um, you know, what they think or what they how they continue with their lives or that there are um, sensible questions about the direction um, that their life will continue um, and uh, and a lot of those films even though they are violent have a lot of questions about you know um, where why i am on, on earth and where i'm going to um, and um, and that makes also the scoring very interesting because it switches between you know, um, disaster and uh, catastrophe and violence. And at the same time, also about a religious kind of uh, question, um, you know, about the limitation of lifetime. And I think these two poles are very interesting in a score to deal with. Now, this brings us to our first question from um, Ivan Sorokin. One Life, especially the finale, is one of the most beautiful, emotional, and teardrops music I heard in recent years. How did you get to it? Did you have any ideas about music after reading the screenplay, or did you need to see the whole movie for bringing all these emotions to life? Well, the the um, the finale is in a way, um, you know, a, a result of the very first scene. Um, in the very beginning, there's this melody and um, 
the, the main theme and uh, somehow with the finale there was this also this um this main th theme um that i wanted to score with the orchestra but somehow one fragment of that melody stuck with me and um I had the feeling I want to work on that little fragment. So suddenly I had two different parts, uh, one with the main melody, but one is also in a way a kind of um, fragment from the main melody that um, is a kind of B theme in in, in the end. And um, I, I really love that these two things were suddenly working together. And that's, you know, in my case, it's something I'm carving. I'm a little bit like a painter um, that puts color on a, on the canvas, um, like let's say ten different colors, and then I'm starting to scrape the color off the canvas so that the the you know the colors that are um, covered are slowly coming to the forefront. That's how I work. Um, a lot and um, by doing that suddenly I recognize that you know the composition shifts and that's how um, how I worked on One Life. You know it's absolutely powerful which brings us to another question from Louis Versalini. Um, when scoring a deeply saddening and tragic movie like One Life how difficult is it to keep the music from going too deep into a dark and saddening state? <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, um, one life has also uh, is also dealing with uh, with German history. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm German, and so in my childhood, there's always this feeling of of guilt and uh, you know being um, responsible for um, you know for the tragedy that happened to you know to all the jews in that in the second world war and i'm um, i was living with that feeling for a long time and if you and i'm still feeling the responsibility and i'm um, you know I, I try to work on it and and uh, put the light on and on the memory of um, of these circumstances that happened there um and what is important for me is not to make you know the whole topic of the deportation too sobby i think it's very important that it still keeps the kind of um you know uh strength uh, and the, the the bright for the people that were deported in a way um that you don't you can't wash over it with sobby and um you know and too sad music because that also is a kind of clashback in a way um so um in a way what i try what i tried is to find the language that underlines what we already see um and that that is not easy to do because a lot of times you want to go into very you know uh in you start to compose and then oh i do another b part and then it uh, it, it gets a little bit out of control so i had to um, calm myself down at the same time I also wanted to um, you know to have emotions and strong emotions and I think this line between those two was the most difficult yeah and it's interesting because the film takes almost kind of like a neoclassical rhythmic approach uh, you know it's dark but it's also really pushing forward with the urgency of the situation to get these kids out of there Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it has a lot of, um, you know, I, I tried a lot with textures of um, string instruments um, and, and you know, keep the themes pretty, uh, let's say, uh, controllable so that there are not too many uh, themes in a way. Um, there was also this part where... Um, uh nicholas is playing the piano um in you know in his room and we also wanted to have a, a melody there so there is also a theme in there that i also repeated later in a um you know in the radio when, when he was listening to uh, to this piece of music and in a way to keep a little bit of a restraint amount of motives in in the film that makes it already more humble and maybe a little bit more um, subtle rather than overwhelming people with a lot of music and with, uh, you know, uh, 
themes after theme after theme. So I try to keep it pretty, pretty simple. How did you see the character of Nikki? Again, you know, he, this guy's a stockbroker and just sees something that he has to act upon. Well, I mean, that this story is so impressive. Um, that comes definitely from his um, straight decision without thinking about his own danger in his own life um, to go in a country where the, he is near, he's in, a, in life danger and helping people that are suffering and also you know specifically then finding out that the kids are the um are the ones that um are not interesting him but that he feels like they need the most help and um i mean that's something that I, you know where i have to always look where i'm looking up to because um i hope that i'm able to you know have make decisions like that when it would come to a situation like that so i'm uh, i think he was a great strong character yeah he, he's an amazing person kind of in the tradition of oscar schindler now we've got a question mm. from louis about your process in general um in your opinion what are the most important questions to ask in a spotting session i mean is there anything that you consider extremely important to know besides where and when should i score a scene well, I think in the spotting session, the most important thing is to feel out what, um, where the boundaries are for of a director. I mean, in the beginning, you have, of course, a conversation about what um, someone likes and what someone doesn't. But in a way, when you look the first time, when you watch to do together um, the film, it gets much more clear where, let's say, where darkness is and what darkness is or what light is and you know, where we need maybe a melody or where it's maybe just a, a tiny ramp or because a lot of times what I found out is that the language um, that non-musicians are using is sometimes so much stronger than musicians think um, than, than the real activity is. So if somebody says, oh, I want to have some um, enormous tension, then I'm thinking about death metal. But if somebody uh, uh, looks at, looks at the enormous tension, it might be that he just means like a hi hat. So this is the area where we um, where we musicians are, you know, dealing with, um, uh, and we have to find out what um, where the levels of dynamic are and what the director means when he, you know, is um, talking about certain instruments and stuff like that. So I think that is the main reason why I do a spotting session. The spots will come anyways, you know. Now, Pranav would like to know, what are the best methods to create soundscapes? Uh, how and when it's appropriate to focus more on an orchestral rather than uh, stuff that people would do otherwise? Oh, and when is uh, pretty focus more on orchestration? Um, well, I mean, a soundscape, uh, for me, there's no, of course, I know the difference between soundscape and orchestration, or, um, but I'm doing both with both ways. I'm orchestrating soundscapes, but I also do, um, you know, um, arranged scores with electronic instruments um, or with synthesizers or whatever so for me there's both things are part of my music and um but to create soundscapes what i really love is to work with real instruments and um and use them as a as a source with effects um in the end so Let's say I'm using a cello and I'm recording it with three instrument, three microphones or four, make it record it very close, record the scratches on the, you know, on the strings and, and stuff like that. And sometimes I'm just using that microphone and I'm putting that in a distortion to actually get the textures more, the, you know, the, the touch of the sound is then much more direct and at the same time more human than, for example, a sample. And so that's why I'm, I'm, my soundscapes are in a way uh, recorded with real instruments and with orchestra as well. So a lot of times 
I'm having just sessions where we just do flautanto layers and uh, I'm trying to figure out how we can make them sound uh, great, you know. No, they really do. And now uh, our producer, Dale Turner, and me were lucky enough to attend a really incredible uh, show that you did uh, at Hollywood Forever, where it's all prepared piano, which brings us to Dale's question. If it's not a trade secret, can you discuss your live piano show uh, gear, your granule delays, loopers, samples, uh, and all generating the incredible yeah. low end mixing on the fly with all the panic, effect, the panic effects? Yeah, it's no. There's no secret in in that performance. I mean, the the main thing is that we use a lot of microphones in the piano and the grand piano um, for the live performance. And specifically because my sound is very loud, um, I needed uh, to find this, uh, a miking system that is not is very unsensitive for feedback. So we use a humbucker pickup from uh, a guy in um, in America called help and still um and his um we are using those uh, pickups already 15 years um or longer because we we were always looking for a microphone that is that i can feed a delay with on stage and not getting into um and that i can actually turn on very loud and that works fantastically and you can boost uh, the sub basses uh, on that piano like a, like a 808 and like a sinus like a hip-hop bass if you want to um so everything from the sound can be created um, just with a piano um, including bass drums hip-hop uh, like um, hi-hats snares and all that and um, then i'm feeding with that um, pick up i'm feeding delay um, delays different ones um, you know interesting ones specifically i love delays that are um, very um, you know random um, so that they are not in time um, so that i can actually use them in a with a knob where I can turn the knob in the, the change the tempo, change the structure. Um, and I'm using distortions. Um, I'm having a, I'm using a loop paddle where I'm looping myself. And the, the only way you have to, the only thing you have to figure out is how, how the, the sends are organized so that um, maybe every effect can be leveled by itself and you have control over everything. And that makes it so nice because I'm playing an hour without a break and then you can make transitions very smoothly with effects and then you go into the next part, but you have the time to develop the next part. And um, that's why I love playing live so much. Yeah, I, I particularly love the bit where you suddenly dug into the piano and like you're dropping all the stuff. I'm like, what's he doing? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm just doing that because I wanted to. Sh I'm showing the the audience a little bit, and I'm doing that since uh, I I would say quite at the beginning, because it shows everyone a little bit that when you take things out, that suddenly the then you realize, ah, okay, it's just like bottle caps and ping pong balls and uh, plastic foil and felt wedges and wooden sticks that are in the on the strings of the piano and they do this these nearly synthesizer like sounds but um, they're all acoustic and uh, amplified and that's it now going back into your career a uh, question from uh, Dimitris from Greece uh, my favorite of your scores is Hotel Mumbai can you talk a little bit more about your ideas for that one yeah, I mean, Hotel Mumbai was a pretty tough one because, uh, first of all, it's mainly, uh, you know, um, shootings and uh, uh, claustrophobic uh, scenes where people are trying to hide and run away. And um, for me, it was very, uh, I think it was one of the first scores where, where, I, where action was in a way full on there. But at the same time, it was not a typical action movie in a you know let's say in a james bond way it was much more an action movie that had had the subtle subtle tension of a horror movie <clears throat> but without being a horror movie and um so i had to find um i had to find textures um you know and i used a lot of prepared piano in that one and a lot of um like big drums that i distorted uh, where i tried to i 
try to find a, a way of making the score quite big, but with solo instruments rather um, than with an orchestra. I added some orchestra um, later for the bigger uh, scenes and also for the end. But in the beginning, there was just electronics, low, low um, drums, um, uh, a cello, and prepared piano, and that was were the the instruments um, for for the score. And um, those instruments are working very well when you do layers of different recordings. Um, for example, a piano. If you do ten layers of prepared piano. Um, it sounds so full uh, and so thick um, that uh, it can actually, um, you know, deal with an action film very well. Now, Esteban uh, from Mexico uh, would love to know how much time did it take for you to compose the theme for All Quiet on the Western Front? One day. Wow! <laughs> yeah, it was the it was it was the day after I've seen the film the first time. That was the main. It, it was a, a lucky situation, and it's not about the world record of um, creating the fastest theme, <laughs> being the fastest creating a film theme. It was really like that. I saw the film. I went back home. Um, on the way, I was thinking I want to find a. I'm, I want to use the harmonium. Um, I came back and the next day I, I did the, the very first uh, cue and I sent it to um, Edward Berger, the director, and uh, I, I only sent him this one piece. Um, being sure that if he says no and he doesn't like it, that I'm in trouble. But um, he, he loved it so much that this became then the, the main theme for the whole film. Yeah, no, it's really effective. And, you know, I have to ask, you know, there's a thing that we call the sonic boram or, <laughs> you know, the, 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 the you, you hear it in a lot of action movies. And in All Quiet mm. in the Western Front, you've got your own version of the sonic boram that's just totally unnerving motif that you hear whenever it's going to hit the fan in the trench. Uh, tell me about mm -hmm. uh, creating that. Well, I mean, I have a harmonium uh, of my grand grandmother here in the studio, and that was refurbished. Uh, it was tuned, and um, you know, I, I got it at some point um, because they wanted to throw it away, and I said, no, no, I, I want to keep it. So I restored it, and it was sitting in my studio. And I was on my way back from the first screening. I said, I need an instrument from that time but I want to make it more modern and I want to find a, a sound that um, in a way reflects also our time. And so I had a, I made a, I had a couple of experiments made beforehand with uh, harmonium and distortion. And I knew that there's something in it that is very heavy and very um, exciting about that sound. So I went back and I looked at those experiments and um, then I, I wanted to find an, uh, a tonal element that has uh, a kind of war horn, like a signal that is a little bit like, let's say, you know, uh, in old um, ancient films where you have the war horn, you know, from the distant when a big army arrives or something like that. I wanted to have something like that, but with a with a single instrument. Um, and something that I can, that I don't need any kind of tempo adjustment so that I can just take this motif and I can put it in every gap in the fights. Um, and that was my my main idea. And so I found these three notes um, and I recorded a little bit of harmonium on top. Um, and actually I also recorded all the textures of the the wood of the paddles i put um, microphones inside of the harmonium to to get all the the crackling and uh, you know so that it sounds like a, a little bit like a ship engine and that was it no it, it's it's absolutely you know unnerving um you know i think back to what life uh a huge reason this movie really hit me you know i'm jewish and my father got out of silesia uh right after kristallnacht uh, and again, mm. here's a movie about these kids who are lucky enough uh, to get out right as it right as it's starting. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. I mean, do you even kind of look into your own past or your, just to, to kind of draw this out, what, what it was like, you know, when, when Hitler really started? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, I, I would say we are even now back into the area where this is much more realistic than it was uh, 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Things are, you know, starting to get again into um, in insanity in certain areas. Uh, and, um, you know, I mean, my, my mother, who is still alive, she's uh, 89 now, um, he was born 1934. My father was born 1931. He was, um, when he was 14, he was, uh, that was in 1945. He was on his way to the, uh, to the front, um, in the age of 14, um, you know, being the last, you know, the last people, you know, getting killed in a way. But, uh, then while he was on its way, he, um, you know, the people told him the war is over, take your uniform off. And so he ran back home. But what um, what that means for me in our family, there was a lot of these stories um, and also, you know, resistance in the villages where um, my, my parents were growing up, like people that tried to resist uh, the regime and uh, resist the um, all the the horrible things that the Nazis were doing at that time. Um, and um, so in a way, when you see a film like that, um, that, that can't leave you cold. This is a part of uh, my history as well. And um, so in a way that influences a lot of the, the emotions that I have for that topic. Yeah, no, it's an incredibly, you know, moving film. Uh, I mean, again, it just shows, you know, how, you know, what really great work you're doing, uh, and which brings us to our question from Van Composer. Uh, you're obviously a great example of an international composer who's successful in Hollywood now. Do you have any advice for aspiring composers who cannot live in L.A.? Well, I'm, I mean, I have to say... Um... You know, since COVID, uh, things have changed in a way that, um, you know, before COVID, I would would have said um, not being in L.A. is difficult um, and having, you know, working on uh, Hollywood films. I think that has changed uh, a bit because a lot of the films that I work on that are Hollywood films are being uh, where the post-production is in London and i'm so much closer to london than every american composer <laughs> you know because i'm from my home it's 50 minutes uh, flight to london i can work there in the morning and i fly back in the evening i could even stay at home and not using a hotel if i want to but um so in a way that has changed a lot and at the same time i think it's always important to uh, you know to be in the scene where you work as well so i'm not a person that um you know is not going to los angeles i love los angeles and i go there very regularly and i'm trying to be a part of um, of as much as i can of the the scene there and you know in new york um, as well uh, as well as in london as well as in berlin so um, i think it's important to be present and uh and work with the people and make yourself visible rather than, you know, sitting in a small German village and pretending to be a Hollywood composer. Um, you know, again, I think, you know, one genre I really particularly like your work in is science fiction. And you did a really cool Netflix movie a while ago called Stowaway about the spaceship that gets an unintended uh, occupant. And not all not all of them are going to make it back. But yet again, you you apply this soulful approach to a really unusual suspense film. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that was the first my first science fiction uh, movie, and that was a very wonderful experience because I had um, a very long um, time of preparing the film, and um, and that was for me a, a, a big uh, a big plus because these films need um you know they need sound research as as much as mostly all the films that i tr i try uh to give myself time to research a little bit and the earlier you have the possibility and you have already an idea of the story 
um, the better because then you can, um, you know, you can go, for example, for a stowaway, we, we build it like huge, like very long um, wires in our hallway and we put contact mics on it. We recorded a, a grand piano with one string. Um, we did a lot of different things that are in the first place uh, where people feel like, oh, um, if that, what, what will the result be and in the end we had a huge pool of um of different sounds that were so interesting that um uh, we once the film was hitting us we had a um, we had such we had such a wide range of sounds and i think for me besides composing and um you know being in the trenches um the sound research and um, the developing of interesting sound experiments is for me one of the nicest parts of um, being a film composer yeah no it's really cool and unusual um so where does volker bertelman end and hauschka begin well i mean uh, hauschka was in the beginning the the start of my individual music career as a the pianist that does electronic you know club club music and experimental music with a with a piano and that was somehow swapping into uh, film music but at some point i recognized that film music is so much more than hauschka because um, it is also a, a compromise and it's also uh, um, a collaboration um, and compromises in not in a negative way you have to work with others on their idea and it also means that you have to make different films you have to have a you have a romantic comedy you have a thriller you have a horror film you have a sci-fi movie you have an animation film so there every film needs a different costume in a way and uh, if i'm just Hauschka, I can't do all of that. and But at the same time, I, I love doing all the other things. So after Lion, I had the feeling that I want to do all my scores under my real name. And I keep Hauschka as my band name where I'm where I can experiment and I'm free of doing anything that I uh, that comes in my mind. But when you look at your really cool alternative career and what you're doing as a film composer, how does each kind of feed into the other? They both uh, are not disconnected at all. They are, I mean, the, the experimentation of um, Hauschka is in a way uh, something that makes that frees me up for, you know, all the the composition work that I have to do because in a way when my head is free i'm not going with any expectation to my computer and start to write i'm just you know starting and i just let it flow and um, the the work as hauschka and going on concerts and just perform improvised concerts every night is in a way something that um, is a little bit like um, like like skiing or uh, wandering or uh, swimming it frees your mind and um, when you come back you are fresh uh, it's not um, you know my concerts are not exhausting in the sense of uh, oh i don't want to play after a tour again it's much more like i'm coming back with a big backpack of sound experiences and um, i i take them with me into the into the film music so these two things are very important um, with each other and that's why i i never would i never want to miss a uh, live concert no very true and anyone who can go see a, a hoshka or vocal concert I, I can't recommend it enough now uh one project you've got coming up is a movie i'm really excited to see and let alone hear what you're going to be doing for it which brings us to our question from aaron cruz uh can you tell us what you'll be doing for the new crow film well um you will see it very soon <laughs> but uh no I, I mean that's the same uh well it's the same work that i've done for you know all the films before i'm experimenting with a lot of um, experimental sounds with modular synthesizers uh, with uh, weird drums with uh, things that i'm where i'm trying to find in a signature sound for a film that is 
you know, dark, but at the same time also emotional because, you know, it deals with, you know, with the uh, love uh, story and it has, there is a lot of uh, emotions in there, but at the same time, you don't want to, you know, uh, spoil the, the action and the darkness and the tension. And that makes um, the whole thing, you know, very like a challenge because you um, you want to find a, a sound where the rom romance is somehow incorporated into the you know the tension and the grid and um, so I you know I I experimented a lot with um, with those um, with synthesizers and sounds and effects and I, I guess there will be a lot of um, hopefully it uh, you know will mix at some point in the next couple of weeks. I will see if everything turns out as I wished, as I wished it. You know, the crow, I mean, again, uh, I definitely look forward to seeing this new variation on it, but he's essentially, it's a dark superhero whose uh, mission is revenge and vengeance. Uh, what's it like mm -hmm. scoring us? I think this is your first superhero film as such. Were you ever a fan of the genre mm -hmm. to begin with? And what's it like kind of dealing with those elements? Well, I mean, yes, I'm a big fan of superhero movies. I'm, you know, it, it depends a little bit um, on the on the story. Uh, I mean, there are some superhero movies uh, where I feel um, I've seen that story already a couple of times. But then there are also very uh, wonderful, fresh approaches. Like I, I would say The Joker was for me a very great approach because it also um was a, a film that had beyond the superhero genre uh, as well some some storytelling that is unusual in a in a superhero movie um that i really like that um in there as well i'm a big fan of dark knight for example is also a, a, a wonderful uh, superhero movie um so and I'm a big fan of action. I mean, I'm uh, I love uh, thrillers and chases and all that. So, in a way, to be able to um, work on a film like that is, in a way, a dream. No, I, I just can't wait to hear what you're going to be doing for it. Um, you know, again, going uh, you know back to one life to wrap up our show. I mean, it just seems like it's a movie and a message that we need now more than ever. And again, it's just so emotionally impactful at the ending of this film. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it, uh, the, the message is actually that we have to um, have the courage to, you know, to help others uh, and as well to, you know, to fight for the things that we um, think is uh, for the things that we think are right. Uh, and um, fighting means in a way that, you know, you help. I think in this case, um, I think that he was uh, so desperate and convincing others um, that also encouraged others to help and then others and others. And that made suddenly um, this whole plan or it materialized the plan and um, I, I see that in a lot of areas in life that um, it's important that you're not only talking about things but um, you if once you start something a lot of times that can grow and you know other people uh, will join you and that, I think that's a good message of that film yeah, and it's so inspiring with your score. Volker, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us at Film Music Live. Watch One Life in Theaters now with Volker's score. It's available on Lakeshore Records. And I want to give a big thanks to the team at Lakeshore Records and Kurt Nishimura for their promos today. And to Thomas Miskews, Sarah Roach, Kyrie Hood at White Bear PR. And thanks to our designer, Mark Banning, producer Dale Turner, and executive producer, Mark Northam. And I'll be seeing you all on the next Film Music Live. Bye, Daniel. Bye-bye.